The parallels between Yuji and Mahito are obviously extensive enough to justify calling them two iterations of one idea. And more importantly for the purpose of this video, these parallels are acknowledged by both of the characters in question themselves. Then what about Ryomen Sukuna? For a character that seems to go out of his way to distinguish himself from practically everybody else, there are substantial ties between him and these two that I want to explore in this video. Of course, pointing out parallels and other connections is an incomplete endeavour without first discussing the broader narrative purpose of them, which in this case is the thing Jujutsu Kaisen has been heading towards for a very long time, the merger. Let's first lay down some kind of foundation. Kenjaku posited that non-sorcerers, sorcerers and curses are all just possibilities of cursed energy in the form of human beings. It is a stance that essentially reverses the traditional understanding of humans and cursed spirits in which, as my words just made clear, there is an inherent distinction made between humans and cursed spirits. This is a distinction that doesn't seem to exist in Kenjaku's position. The traditional understanding is that humans exude cursed energy in varying degrees and that energy is directed at a particular phenomenon, place, concept, whatever. The cursed energy then congeals to form a cursed spirit which is informed by whatever the energy was directed at. So if a cursed spirit were formed out of a fear of spiders for instance, it would take on spider-like characteristics, eat some humans, breed more fear of spiders among them and then consequently grow stronger. It's a vicious cycle of pain and suffering, at least that's the traditional perspective. Kenjaku's position on the matter reverses the places occupied by cursed energy and the life forms associated with it in the equation. According to him, cursed energy informs humanity, not the other way around. This is where his ideological conflict with Yuki originates from. If you believe cursed energy plays a foundational role in human organisms, broadly speaking, you would try to optimize that energy instead of break away from it if you were trying to bring about the evolution of humanity. To him, this is not a vicious cycle of pain and suffering, but one of progression, one of possibility. It's safe to say, with Kenjaku's goal about to be realized shortly, that the existing paradigm, the way cursed energy is understood, will be completely overturned. And at the center of it all are these three characters. Let me explain. The purpose of the Culling Games is to ultimately create a being that achieves exactly what we've been talking about. As with any experiment, there are prototypes and failures. Choso is one such failure. Maybe you could consider Yuji in the same light too, by extension. As for prototypes, that's where Mahito and Sukuna enter the conversation, both with their own significance. Mahito is a cursed spirit born out of human beings' as negative emotions directed at other humans. Broadly speaking, a curse born from humanity itself. That's exactly what the product of the merger will be, or just the merger for short, except you wouldn't really classify it as a curse. On the other hand, the Culling Games in its entirety is inspired by Sukuna. He is a being that has somehow organically transcended humans and cursed spirits. He's the embodiment of the latent potential of cursed energy that Kenjaku is trying to realize and go even further beyond. The inspiration for Sukuna's character, which many may not know is an urban legend that was popular in Akutami's hometown, contains tons of key parallels to the process of the Culling Games itself. The Culling Games is based on a Chinese practice called Gu. You may be more familiar with its Japanese derivative, the Kodoku Ritual, where a lot of poisonous insects are trapped in a jar. A battle royale between the insects ensues and the last survivor is either used to make a strong poison or as a curse on someone. This is referenced in various anime manga and the most popular example I can think of is the ongoing succession war of Hunter x Hunter. I say ongoing but this arc started years before Jujutsu Kaisen and we all know just how much Akutami loves Togashi's work. Regardless, with Sukuna bearing the title King of Curses and being characterized as a lethal poison himself, it is very fitting. It's even more fitting when you realize the word Kodoku translates to loneliness, perhaps the most prevalent theme concerning this character and his encounters. The Culling Games is very obvious obviously based on the Kodoku ritual, with the rules inciting a battle royale and the outcome being one life form that transcends everything else. Sukuna ties into this through the urban legend I mentioned in which he's said to be born from a sort of makeshift Kodoku ritual. Now there are a few variants of this legend on the internet and I'm just going off of the one I've read, I'm more than happy to be corrected in the comments if I get something wrong because this seems to be some pretty niche information that a lot of Jujutsu Kaisen fans aren't aware of. The legend goes like this. 
there was a pair of Siamese twins born to a poor family in the Iwate prefecture. The family's poverty compelled them to sell the twins to a freak show. Later, a cult leader called Mononobe Tengoku bought them off and locked them in a room for days without food or water, along with other people who had physical deformities. The twins, resorting to cannibalism, ended up surviving, whereas everyone else in the room died. Tengoku then starved them to death, mummified them, cut their stomach open and filled it with the powdered remains of several criminals, and then used the corpse as a curse on the land of Japan, causing various disasters around the country. So yeah, very grim, disturbing and dark legend, but you can see the inspiration clearly taken from various threads, like Ryomen meaning two-faced, the incision in his stomach translating to the mouth that Sukuna's Heian form has on his stomach, the mummy or the Sokushimbutsu of Sukuna that we see at the very beginning of the story, and later when Ken Jaku reintroduces it, Sukuna's status as a cursed object, Sukuna's characterization as a calamity, so on and so on. The most important aspect to take from all this is the idea that Sukuna was born of a Kodoku ritual. Considering his other characteristics I've laid out, it's an easy claim to make that this serves as the inspiration for the Cullen games as a whole, and it doesn't stop at some lore connections either. Subtraction was said to be the essence of excellence in Jujutsu. If you can shorten the steps required to activate a curse technique without sacrificing its efficacy, you should do it. Yet the strongest of all time has literally optimized his body in order to maximize his Jujutsu. A second mouth to keep the chants going. A second set of arms to keep the hand signs going. It's the opposite of subtraction, which is very similar to how you can't subtract rules from the culling games, but you can add to them. Sukuna and Kenjaku, the two characters who drive this narrative the most, exist in contradiction to what is believed. They are both incomprehensible. And so bringing it back to where I started, the epicenter of humanity's evolution to the next stage is occupied by Mahito, Ryomen Sukuna, and Itadori Yuji. Three different possibilities of humanity in the form of cursed energy. Across the story, connections between these characters have been constructed to convey the idea that despite how highly individualistic they are, well, at least two of them, or how different from each other they're perceived to be, they're all informed by the same energy. One key thing that the previous section of the video did not make clear is Yuji's role in the final stages of the culling games. That's because, honestly speaking, I have no idea what Gege has planned. It's obviously going to be massive, but like the merger itself, I have no idea how this will manifest. Every theory is as valid as the next, but the truth is, nobody except Gege himself can tell you anything with any degree of certainty. Especially here, since there seems to be no direct tie between Yuji and the birth of the merger like there is for Mahito and Sukuna. That said, what I can tell you for certain is that Yuji's connections to Mahito and Sukuna both are very tangible. He's obviously going to be important, but these connections specifically are substantial enough to reasonably assume he will have something integral to do with the merger. Also, contrary to popular belief, he is the protagonist of Jujutsu Kaisen after all, so really, it's fair to assume as much. In this section, let's break down the dynamic of Yuji and Mahito. Let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. Yuji's core cool motivation for the better part of the series comes from the curse left behind by his grandfather, compelling him to save people. The curse imbued him with purpose, something that led him to a situation where he'd be propped up as the protagonist, the centerpiece of a lot of Jujutsu High School's missions, whether by their own design or otherwise, despite him being extremely new to sorcery. Hosting Sukuna was something only he could do. My most popular video on the channel explores exactly this. Although this characteristic of Yuji has taken various twists and turns, and I've described it rather simplistically for the sake of brevity, the most fundamental parallel between Yuji and Mahito originates from it. Jogo propped up Mahito to be the leader of the disaster curses, despite Mahito only being a few months old. Both of these individuals, with their very short Jujutsu careers and their significant importance in their respective factions despite that, are at the end of the day revealed to simply be pieces on Kenjaku's board game. They were built the same from the get-go. Let's dive a little deeper. Yuji's name is written like this. The second character in Yuji's name is a kanji that means humanity. It also means benevolence. The first character in his family name means tiger, and in Japan, a tiger is symbolic of strength, courage, and protection. This is why emperors, kings, and the samurai class adopted the tiger as their emblem. Basically, the quote-unquote best of humanity, the cream of the crop if you will, associated themselves with the tiger. His whole name is a pointer to how he represents the best of humanity, strength, courage, benevolence. Mahito's name is shorter and thus much simpler to break down. Made up of two characters meaning true and human respectively. Very obvious tie to the driving force behind the disaster curse's mission, which is to establish that they, the cursed spirit, 
spirits are the true humans. If you sound it out though, even though the kanji is different, ma is a prefix in Japanese meaning evil. That's where you get Majin Buu from, by the way. It literally means demon Buu. Actually, quite ironic now that I think about it, considering Yuji himself was referred to as a demon god. Both Yuji and Mahito represent humanity in their very names, but they represent diametrically opposite things. Benevolence versus malevolence. And Yuji carries something symbolic of humanity in his name whilst being characterized as a demon god, whereas all Mahito ever did was stay true to his evil instincts, and he's literally called a real, true human, as opposed to Yuji's symbolic humanity. It's pretty evident that even when they appear to mirror each other, there's more overlap than meets the eye. Speaking of mirrors, I want you to remember Mahito being called the mirror of humanity and how it manifests in death. This is why, when Mahito was standing before Nanami in the manga, Nanami saw Haibara, his biggest regret. It's a very neat way to reinforce what would otherwise be a one-off hype tool kind of line, and it's why the artistic liberty the anime took with this scene, placing Mahito behind Nanami, is one of the very few changes made in the anime I dislike. Yuji also functions as a mirror of humanity, again in the opposite sense. Yuji's entire existence in the manga is as a vessel, and it goes beyond Tsukuna. From the get-go, Yuji involves himself almost exclusively in situations where only he can do something. The occult research club could only be saved if he registered. Tsukuna could only be vanquished if he ate the fingers. Mahito could only be defeated by him. The Tokyo team could only secure their victory in that little tournament if he held Todo back. Eventually though, this mindset slowly morphs into the cog mentality that defines him for a long while. Even then though, what Yuji reflects throughout the story is the hopes of others. Where they see their regrets in Mahito, they see the opposite in Yuji. They hope he can finish what they started. They hope he can do what they couldn't do, be what they couldn't be. Yuji internalizes the wishes of all those around him and that's what fuels him to keep moving. Another way Yuji and Mahito's similar status as mirrors of humanity is enforced, and this happens to be my favorite, is how Sukuna treats both of them as such. The first instance is when he told Mahito to know your place fool. The word he used for fool directly translates to one who does not know anything. The presentation of this scene in the manga is also such that Sukuna is looking straight at us, the readers, as he says that line. The second instance, as you might have guessed it, is when he speaks to Yuji after taking over Megumi's body, again addressing humanity as a whole in some form, since he's talking about humanity's weakness and how they should live with their heads down trying to stifle their misery. Here his little eyes looking at the reader. The reason for his addressing humanity as a whole, especially in the first instance where it's not immediately clear through his speech alone, is something I've talked about more in this video at the corner of the screen if you're interested. Since I've established a lot of foundational ideas in the previous sections, these next two dynamics should be a lot easier to explain. Let's briefly discuss Yuji and Tsukuna. If you remember the lore of Ryom and Tsukuna we discussed at the start of the video, it seems to be the case that one of the foremost parallels between Yuji and Tsukuna is in the very nature of their existence. Tsukuna, in the myth, is the product of Mononobe Tengoku's experiments, and in JJK, he's a parasite in the modern era, mandatorily requiring a host to function. Yuji is the product of Kenjaku's plans, an entity created solely to contain Tsukuna and be his vessel. Both of them are artificial entities to some degree. There isn't a thing that seems natural about them. The irony here is that Tsukuna in Jujutsu Kaisen seems to be more of an insertion than an adaptation. There are various accounts of this name, Ryom and Sukuna, in different texts. The actual legends recorded in the Nihon Shoki, which is the second oldest book of classical Japanese history, not the 2chan urban legend that Gege cited as a source, refers to Sukuna as someone that took great pleasure in plundering people and was rebellious towards the emperor. However, the people of the Hida province considered him a benevolent ruler. They even considered him an incarnation of the Bodhisattva Kanon, who is known for healing people's ailments with compassion. A real possibility here is that since the emperor at the time was likely threatened by Tsukuna's popularity in the region, he had him killed, and thus history was decided by the victor. Jujutsu Kaisen attempts to adapt both ideas in tandem, perhaps as a commentary on the ambiguity of history. Tsukuna was treated as a deity in the Heian era and he also behaves like a deity in the modern era, retaining his aristocratic speech as seen in his last words to Gojo, and also retaining his willingness to bless those who would pray to him with offerings. But there's obviously Obviously the flip side too, like when Yuji asks him to heal Junpei and Tsukuna practically tells him to f*** off, not very bodhisattva of him. 
What I'm getting at is that, in a metafictional sense, Sukuna is a character that is not artificial in the same way someone like Satoru Gojo is. Sukuna isn't a creation of Gege himself, and in that sense, he isn't reliant on Gege constructing his character like Gojo is, who was verbatim stated to have been constructed to serve as an unambiguous power ceiling for the world of JJK. In fact, it's somewhat the opposite for Sukuna since we have to look into the Nihon Shoki and the online urban legends to get a window into his past. I don't mean this as a negative thing, either. A lot of people would probably jump to slander the series and the character, but it's honestly very cool to me that we can get a character as expressive and layered in characterization as Sukuna without a single flashback to his name. He isn't reliant on this outside lore either, since he is designed to be incomprehensible both within the narrative to other characters and to the reader. And to understand the incomprehensible, Gege gave us some cool things to look into if you're somebody like me who enjoys digging. Moving on to the second parallel. Sukuna values strength. Shocking, I know. But it goes beyond just valuing strength. He has very specific ideas about strength and individualism that rejects everything about the concept of collective strength. The story has consistently aligned with these ideas too, considering everyone that relies on others for their strength in any capacity is punished for it in the story. While Yuji would normally come to mind as an example first and foremost, think about why he suffers from so much self-hatred for a second. Yuji is a guy that believes he should be the one to help people, as one of the strong. Yet time and time again he fails, and the fact he's too weak to help anyone or affect anything created his self-hatred and continually exacerbates it, another one of the many cyclical curses he bears. And although framed quite differently, it's fundamentally the same reason as to why Sukuna harbors disdain for weak humans too. They're disgraceful and live insignificant lives, unable to do anything as they please. That is why he looks down upon them. It's the exact same idea, but approached from completely opposite ends. Sukuna projects it outwards and forces the story itself to bend to his ideals, whereas Yuji internalizes it and it feeds feeds into his self-hatred. It's tragic, really, especially when you realize Yuji's whole underlying motivation to guide people to quote-unquote proper deaths is something he has failed to do time and time again while Sukuna succeeds. The four people we see him kill after a drawn-out battle all die with contentment. Jogo's worth was affirmed, Gojo's identity crisis was resolved, Kashimo's dilemma was answered, and Higuruma died with a sense of redemption. He effortlessly and unintentionally does what Yuji yearns for, what he has to strive and continuously fails to do. But it's not always failure. Like with their similar mentalities, it's a matter of framing. Yuji kills Esso, complicit in killing Kechizu, kills a load of transfigured humans and feels guilty for each and every one of them. Surely none of them were proper deaths, right? But you have to consider how each transfigured human was suffering, to the point that one of them asked Nanami to finish them off. Esso and Kechizu suffered due to Choso's choice of living as a curse. Yuji ended that suffering for all of them. Could this not also be called a good death? The line Lines are very blurred, and so feel free to disagree with my interpretations of these things as, like I said, it is a matter of framing. At the end of the day, the key point I hope to illustrate is that Yuji and Sukuna are built incredibly similarly. One of the most popular JJK theories is that Yuji is one of the two Siamese twins I mentioned at the start of the video that somehow got separated from Sukuna. Another very popular theory is that Yuji could be Sukuna's discarded humanity. There's weird similarities in how the death painting wombs have certain elements in their designs that additively constitute Sukuna's design. Kechizu's mouth resembles Sukuna's stomach. Esso's winking ties into Sukuna's appendages in the two extra arms. Choso and Sukuna's birthmark or tattoo thing on their noses, and of course the similar hair shared between Yuji and Sukuna. Although I don't really know if there's a strong connection there beyond the fact that it strengthens the idea that the Cullen games are based on Sukuna. Kenjaku's attempts to bring forth the latent potential of cursed energy resulted in the death painting wombs, whose design elements add up to form Sukuna. Exactly what the merge is going to be. A being created by an additive process. Beyond this, if you have any theories on what this means or what it could lead to, I would love to see that in the comments. Lastly, we have Mahito and Sukuna. The first similarity that jumps out at you is how well aligned with their own selves they are. The way they live, in accordance with nothing but their own whims and desires, immediately paints a picture of the similarities shared by these two beings. Where this gets a little complex is the sustainability of their respective mindsets. Mahito's philosophy is hedonistic nihilism. Nihilism proposes that all values are arbitrary, that material phenomena are impermanent, and life is therefore meaningless. As such, you only live once. The hedonistic nihilist believes you might as well enjoy your life to the max, chase that next thrill no matter what. It doesn't matter how your pursuit of personal pleasure affects others or whether it shortens your life as life has no inherent value. Do whatever the you want to do. But this is not the face of someone that fully believes their own life has no inherent value. Faced with death, Mahito 
shits his pants. His iteration of the philosophy that Sukuna supposedly shares with him is not sustainable. Sukuna, on the other hand, is a hedonist to the T. Only his pleasure and displeasure exist. Hedonism is not particularly a sustainable philosophy either. For regular humans, that is. Kashimo's question to Sukuna upon hearing his philosophy exemplifies what I'm saying. We are unable to conceptualize a life where our entire being is devoted to chasing the next thrill. Doesn't it eventually get boring? How can you keep this up forever? What's the meaning in leading such a life? Sukuna's answer to this is exactly what a higher being would say. We humans are inherently predisposed to the need to seek meaning in our lives. What we do is bigger than what we are. For Sukuna, only his pleasure and displeasure exist. His pleasure and displeasure are the bread and butter of the story itself. His moral compass informs the story's moral compass. Did you fight selfishly instead of relying on your kamikaze trump card? Congratulations, you're rewarded with a domain expansion. Did you rely on Tengen instead of expanding your own domain and relying on your own strength? Unacceptable. Kill yourself. You see what I mean? Hedonism isn't sustainable for anybody except Sukuna. He fulfills the most fundamental tenet of hedonism, that is one's pleasure being one's only moral compass taken to its logical extreme. Not only is Sukuna's pleasure his own moral compass, but as a deity in the story, as a being that stands above all in a world governed by power where might makes right, this has become the moral compass of everybody else, whether or not they like it or even realize it in the first place. Sukuna can wait a millennium in solitude if that means his next battle is something as stimulating as the one Satoru Gojo gave him. For anyone else, this is impossible. Even Gojo's time in the prison realm having no effect on him is because life itself resembles that prison for him. A void of darkness with the weight of the world on his shoulders. I speak about this at length in this video at the corner of the screen. Faced with this clear difference, it gets quite hard to convincingly argue that Mahito and Sukuna have the same mentality. I think the more accurate statement is that Mahito shares Sukuna's mentality if Sukuna were an immature baby. Look at how they both treat Yuji. The difference there is actually symptomatic of the differences between them in the larger context. Mahito was too obsessed with Yuji, going so far as tying the worth of his own existence with Yuji's since he said he would only truly be born after killing Yuji. Sukuna has no such limiters. He antagonizes Yuji just as much as he would anybody else. His only measure of worth is himself. At least this was true until chapter 248, where Sukuna's character begins to show signs of him perhaps going down a very similar route as Mahito's. I began working on this video long before that chapter came out, so it hasn't fully been factored into this analysis, but that will definitely be a topic for another day. The recent chapters have been doing wonders for developing Sukuna and shining a completely new light on the story's biggest enigma. The parallels between Mahito and Sukuna don't end there though. For instance, as far as Yuji is concerned, both Mahito and Sukuna play the same functional role. They both challenge his hero complex on a deep, intimate level. They both kill one of Yuji's mentors each, they both kill one of Yuji's friends each, and they both um, disable a friend of Yuji's each, leaving their respective statuses very questionable. I'm looking particularly at you, Miss Nobara. Remember when I said some shit about how Mahito blurs the line between two concepts that don't intersect? Now remember what I said about the nature of Sukuna's existence as being both constructed and exceedingly organic simultaneously? Well, this is a parallel that's worth digging into deeper. One key factor of Sukuna's character writing is that his only scale of worth is himself. He doesn't care one bit about what others may think of him. This is on full display in Gojo vs Sukuna. Gojo specifically said, my students are watching, I've got to look good. Sukuna was okay with looking embarrassingly bad for 13 chapters straight, as long as his plan worked out, his ultimate attack succeeded, and he came out of the fight not just a victor, but more powerful than he entered it. That's all that matters to him. Of course, as the narrative usually does, it sucked him off and made him look good anyways, so there's that. What's interesting is how the way he carries himself could be viewed as contradictory to that characteristic. The open barrier domain expansion that Sukuna can perform is regarded with reverence. The narrator calls it a divine technique akin to painting on air, but I'm 99% sure that it's a binding vow to root the domain in place with a physical structure being its center, the shrine in this case, rather than Sukuna himself in exchange for the barrier being open. And of course, in exchange for the domain having an escape route built into it via the open barrier, you get the incredible range of the domain. Why does this matter? Well, there's nothing divine about a contract, especially when you're supposed to be the overlord of that very energy you're contracting with. The latest chapter literally confirms the popular theory about the world cleaver being tied to a binding vow, but again, that will be discussed in the future Sukuna videos I have planned. Now, Sukuna likely made that vow to push 
push the limits of his jujutsu like he did in the Gojo fight, which is fine, but the fact that he made something that could be construed as divine, his default domain, speaks volumes about the intention on his part to be construed that way. And of course, this is one of many examples of his behavior that speaks to this, like his speech pattern being that of an aristocrat, him behaving like a deity and granting favors to the twins and Jogo, getting the first crops of the season offered to him in the Heian era, etc, etc. Another example of Sukuna blurring the line between two concepts that don't exactly intersect is his very appearance. He's built like a Hindu or Buddhist deity with multiple arms, faces and mouths, but looking like a deity may not be the end in of itself, because we know that his body is geared towards optimizing his jujutsu. The point is, we can't tell. Like Mahito, various elements of Sukuna's character blurs the lines between two seemingly contrasting possibilities. These three dynamics we explore today, specifically when viewed side by side, are currently the most important dynamic in Jujutsu Kaisen. Why do I think so? Well, like the title suggests, these connections prove that the merger needs to happen, because they are specifically constructed to act as a setup for it, at least in the capacity that we discussed in this video. This isn't a theory video, so I haven't attempted to provide a concrete answer to the big elephant in the room. What specifically does all of this lead to? There is still so much to consider. For instance, if Kenja who truly believes there's no distinction between humans and cursed spirits, why was he so derisive of Hanami, referring to her as cursed spirit in a derogatory sense? There's an obvious answer to this, that to an extent, Kenjaku's mannerisms are affected by the host body, and Suguru Geto hated everything except sorcerers, especially cursed spirits. But this just adds to my point, there's no hard facts here, no one interpretation is right. One of the core points explored in this video is that the thematic constituents of the merger actively blur the lines between ideas that don't intersect. Besides this, it's a fact that there's still merit in the traditional understanding of humans and cursed energy. The three existing forms of cursed energy, with their distinctions, are still major parts of the equation. Also, I know that Kenjaku's motivations are largely just his personal curiosity, but I'm speaking more in terms of JJK's framework and how this position affects it, rather than do some kind of character analysis through it. After all, with JJK's tendency to revert to traditional things, like the revival of the Heian era, it's pretty evident that even with the birth of the merger, the demon, the curse, and the king will retain their significance significance in the series. The product of the merger is the answer to all of this. It has clearly been established to serve as the culmination of all the major themes and conflicts Jujutsu Kaisen has presented us with. Every single revived Heian sorcerer has shown an interest in it, and it also opens the door to ending the cycle of cursed energy. It ties together Yuki, Kenjaku, and Tengen, who are all characters that are currently the community's punching bag for being treated in unsatisfying ways, which I only disagree with because I adamantly believe their roles in the story is yet to pay off, and it will pay off tremendously with the merger. It is the only way that Japan can deal with curses, that this cycle can be put to an end. There is no Satoru Gojo anymore, there's no safety net keeping society under wraps. Cursed energy kinda needs to go, the merger needs to happen, and as crazy as it sounds, it's probably gonna save the world. This video was a collaborative effort with my good friend Detective Critics. Please check out his channel and Twitter in the description for some of the best Jujutsu Kaisen content I have come across. Drop him a subscribe too, there's going to be videos on his channel that I'm working on as well. With that, we've reached the end of the video. Thank you guys for watching and I hope you come back for more.